Welcome to the Caldwell County Heritage Museum. I'm Cindy Day, the uh, director here. Appreciate you coming today. You're in for a delightful treat as when the Smith sisters pre do their presentation. Just a few logistics. Uh, restrooms through this door to my left down the hall. Uh, at the back doors, the men's restroom, the ladies' restroom is down the short hall. If we need to evacuate the building for an emergency, go out the front door where you came in. At the back wall under the middle window is also a door, and at the end of this hall is another exit door. And please turn your phones off uh, or put them on vibrate. I've known Susan and Pam for a long time, and I just met uh, Claire today. I knew Pam and Susan when I was working in the school system. Pam taught my oldest one when he was taking chemistry at South Caldwell. Her high standards as a teacher paid off when he went to state. How many students can say their high school chemistry teacher gave them notes they would later use in college? I got to know Susan as well as a teacher and when she worked at the Ed Center as a staff member. She had an answer for every quite crazy question that I had. She knew exactly what I needed to do to find the answer or she would give me the answer that I needed. We also played in the Harper Band together for about a semester and enjoyed doing that together. I also know Tim, Pam's husband, when my boys were playing rec ball at Granite Falls Rec Center. I just met Claire today and she is as delightful as her sisters. So welcome the Smith sisters. We will be going back and forth a lot today and I'm sorry about that, but the first thing I want to do is thank you all for being here. I cannot believe that there's so many people here and it's good to see all the wonderful faces. Um, my sisters and I want to share our adventures of the incredible journey that we took in the summer of 2016 when we recreated our granddad's trip that he took in 1922 across the country and back. And we're also going to be sharing some of the history of Lenore and of him at, when he was younger here too. It's literally impossible for us to cover all that we want to talk about without getting off topic and getting silly because we really did get silly on the trip. So you'll have to pardon that we made some notes to try to stay on topic and get it covered in time and not trying to do it off the top of our head. And I want to start by introducing everyone so that you know who all we are. Um, we are the, the three Silly Smith sisters. We are the granddaughters of Lloyd Smith Sr., who this trip was all about, and the daughters of Lloyd Smith Jr. and Ann Smith. This is our mother over here. You can wave to, to everybody, okay? I am the oldest. We were all born here in Lenore and we were raised in Lenore and educated in Lenore, and I still live here in Lenore. Um, I'm the math nerd in the family. I taught in the Caldwell County School System and retired here and still teach part-time at CCC and TI with my lovely colleagues here. But the next in line is Claire Cates. She's our computer science nerd. Um, she left Lenore, went to college, and never looked back, and now <laughs> resides at Carolina Beach. It's a really sad life to have to live at the beach, and I know we all feel very sorry for her, but she did make a big sacrifice to come up here. She had knee surgery and a knee replacement the last week in August, and so she drove all the way up here on a bad knee to be with you today. And my youngest sister, Pam Cook, resides in Granite Falls. She's the chemistry nerd. And she taught chemistry at South Caldwell for many years. And she's also now retired, but she does substitute teaching and she's the writer in the family. And you'll hear more about that later. So to begin with, I wanna tell you a little bit about the trip in 2016. We took off in the summer on our big adventure. The three of us rented a van from the Charlotte airport and traveled on the craziest route across North America from, from North Carolina to California and back and it was a real adventure, that's for sure. We'll tell you more about the adventure in detail later, but here are some facts about our trip. It lasted a total of 27 days, and we put 7,700 miles on the van. And for my math friends, that averages to be over 300 miles a day. We stayed at a different hotel every single night. 
which means we did a lot of loading and unloading and loading and unloading and we got very good at having our roles about loading and unloading the van down to a science. <laughs> yeah we did have it down to a science um, along the way we saw all of America we saw vast wilderness we saw ghost towns we saw small towns and we saw big cities and we traveled on back roads dirt roads roads that most people would not even consider roads at all most of the time we were the only car on the road and often for very long periods of time there were times when we would go for an hour without seeing another car at all at first this felt a little creepy when we first left it was kind of like this is a little weird but we got very used to it and by the time we were had done it for several days when we got to the cities, we felt like we didn't like it. And we really got to liking the back roads. And so every trip that we have taken since then, we try to find the back roads and we stay off the big roads. As we traveled, we saw every vista imaginable, desert, swamps, flatlands, big skies, magnificent mountains, rivers, oceans, lakes, and even extinct volcanoes. You can't imagine all the beautiful things we saw along the way. Of course, none of the pictures you're gonna see will capture the true beauty that we saw, but we wanna share some of them with you. Now, before we made the trip, and we told people what we were gonna do, they all warned us that we would hate each other by the end of the first week. And they kept saying, don't do it, don't do it, you'll hate each other by the first week. But we never have laughed so hard in all our lives. We had the best time in the car, all those long days, we'd get up early in the morning, and we would be out until late in the evening and we laughed and laughed. It was a spiritual trip, exhilarating and uplifting. And since then, we've made it a point to travel every year together on a trip. Each journey we take, we have our own roles and we all do the di certain things. But for this presentation, we wanna give special thanks to my sister Pam because she put the PowerPoint presentation together that you're going to see. And I want to thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Pam now because she's going to give you some historical background. I'd like to introduce you to my grandfather, Lloyd Smith Sr., more affectionately known to us as Dandy, but to everyone in our area known as the car salesman extraordinaire. To set the stage for our adventures, you must first know how it all came about. So buckle your seat belts. Well, they didn't have seat belts back then, so just hold on because it's a bumpy ride. This was Lloyd many years ago. He went to NC State where he studied agriculture. But after college, he worked at Reynolds Tobacco in Winston-Salem for a couple of years. In Winston-Salem, Elizabeth Lib Easley caught his eye. However, something else caught his attention, a voice calling him and his three good friends to go west, young men. Not the west as we know it today, but a wild, wild west that had just been tamed. Did they want to just go see it, or did they want to put roots there and live there for the rest of their lives? Well, either way, they'd need a reliable car to get there, and nobody had one. So, off Lloyd went to buy a car. He picked up a two-year-old Model T for a little over $400. Well, mass production of Model Ts had been driving the prices down, so we have absolutely no idea why he paid a little over $400 when you could buy a brand new one for $355. Well, either way, equipped with this new car that was reliable, the four of them set off for a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across the United States to see things that people in the East had never seen really before, or at least most of them, to see, you know, these wonderful landscapes and terrains that were unimaginable in these parts. But on this trip out west, I think that he must have realized in all this time that he had that he made a stupid purchase and wonder why he paid so much for this car. You know, surely he saw some cars for sale, brand new cars for sale, similar to the one in this ad that's for 
you know, $295 and wondered, what in the world did I do? And then when the job didn't pan out in California and they had to come all the way back, he had even more time to think about it. Who knows, but I think this set the stage for his career in car sales. As luck would have it, while he was on his trip, two of his older brothers, Marvin and Herb Smith, they opened a new Dodge business, and that dealership was in Lenore. When Lloyd returned from his trip, he joined the business. For a few months, they wanted him to work in the office, but he wouldn't have any part of that. I'm sure he was still thinking about buying that car and wanting to get into sales, and so off he went into car sales. So in 1922, he started his lifetime in car sales. Their first location was in the small building next to the Western Auto, what we think of as the Western Auto building on Mulberry Street. Notice the arched doorways. Rufus Ford occupied the main Western Auto building at that time. As you can tell, they've taken down the old building and replaced it with a newer version over the years. But business boomed for the Smith brothers, and in June of 1925, just three short years from their startup, they needed to move to a larger space. And where did they go? Right across Mulberry Street to a place that was constructed just for them. This new, larger location allowed them to add the Nash cars to their Dodge dealership. With this large showroom full of service garage, full service garage and basement, the gas pumps were on the road, they quickly became one of Lenore's top businesses. Currently, the building holds a church, but the windows have all been closed in and the brick has been painted. However, you can still see numerous similarities in these two buildings. Despite the new expanded location, it couldn't keep up with their growing business. So on August the 9th, 1928, three years after their last move, they moved once again. This time, it was across town and the whole town was really excited. There were ads all throughout the paper. This move was to a nice two-story Jennings building on West Avenue that housed not only their business, but also the battalion for the armory in the upstairs section. I can't show you a current picture of the building because in 1985, the Jennings building was taken down. This is a picture from the newspaper. And in its place, the Lenore Police Department. But back to the story. In this picture, you can see Lloyd in the center and Herb to the right and his father all the way to the far right. His father's name was Waitzel. Marvin had already left the business to pursue other interests. This picture was made in 1929, while the Plymouth Dodge dealership that they owned was really booming. But then it happened. The Great Depression hit, and people didn't have money to buy cars. They struggled to keep their business afloat for several years, but had to close the doors in 1933. Herb kept a small car business going on Willow Street but he couldn't afford to keep Lloyd on board, and so what would he do? He had a wife to support and two young sons to feed, one on the way. He had to keep working. So he looked around town and sought out a job, and wouldn't you know it, he found one that even had the Smith name in it. It was back in the Western Auto building, the entire building this time. His building had come full circle. His business, the business that he worked in now was owned by Irvin Smith. No kin whatsoever. 
and they sold Fords because Ford was mass produced. They could still sell for less and people were still buying. The main building still looks really similar to what it looked like back in the day. This picture was made in the late 30s or early 40s in front of the business and Lloyd stayed with the business for uh, about 20 years or a little over 20 years and all those years you know selling those Fords that he had to be thinking about that stupid purchase he made just rehashing it over and over and over again back in 1922. In 1957 his brother Herb sold his automobile business to Rooster Bush and thus began Bush Oldsmobile. In 1958, Lloyd left Smith Motors and joined Rooster Bush to sell Oldsmobiles. Their new location was at Smith Crossroads next to the Hannah's Bar where Hannah's Barbecue is now. Many of you may recognize that building still. It's in disrepair, but it's still there. About the same time, Smith Motors moved to Smith Crossroads, and the Crossroads got its name. Got its name. For the next six years, business boomed for Bush Oldsmobile, so Rooster started construction on a new location. In 1966, they moved Bush Oldsmobile to its current 32-acre location on Hickory Boulevard. Later that same year, Lloyd was inducted into the gold chapter of the Master Salesman's Guild, the highest honor for Pontiac Motors. Lloyd continued to work at Bush Olds for many years, but after selling cars for over 50 years, Bush Olds decided to throw him a dual birthday retirement party. And while there, they celebrated that Lloyd had just sold 300 new cars last year at the age of 80. That's a lot of cars. That's almost a car a day. Here's a picture of our grandfather with his three sons. Holt to the left, my grandfather, my father, Lloyd Jr., and then Harris to the right. But notice up there it says, this is all at that party, supposed retirement party. My grandfather had no intention of retiring. And that's at 80. Here he is five years later, and he's still just discussing his retirement. Yes, Lloyd continued to sell cars through 1987, all the way up to a few months before his death in February of 1988. A remarkable 65 years of car sales. I bet some of you bought a car from my grandfather. Despite all the thousands of cars he sold over the years, he was always a friendly, humble, unassuming man who lived an ordinary lifestyle in a simple home. And he never owned more than one car at a time and often kept them for 10 to 15 years. It wasn't until many years after our father passed away, our own father passed away, in 2004 that the family all came together and we began to discover the treasures that were held in our grandfather's life and story. And I'll hand this over to my sister. A couple of years back we were up at the Methodist Church. Uncle Holt had been going through some of Dad's and Granddad's stuff and discovered a journal that Granddad had actually written discussing his trip in 1922. Cousin or Uncle Holt and Susan Sarah Clark transcribed the journal because if you we actually have a copy of the journal over there, but if you watch it and look at it, you can see that it's really hard to read. But they transcribed it and printed it out and handed it out at the family reunion. The passages in it were just fascinating. Uh, I read a few passages while I was there and I was like, oh my gosh. And then later that night, I got home, I read the entire journal and was just amazed. Uh, the journal includes story about eating roadkill, camping almost the entire way, seeing Ty Cobb and George, George Seisler play baseball, and even sleeping in a jail one night. 
Granddad and his friends also worked at times and spent several weeks in San Pedro in the shipyard. The journal mentioned pictures, but who knew where those were? During this time frame, I had the habit of going up and visiting mom, and then she has boxes and boxes of pictures. And I would take a box of pictures, take them back to the coast, and then actually do a deep scan on them. And the book has the journal, the pictures, and then I started collecting history of the era and of where he went. I would research the history into the night and it became an addiction. I would tell folks I was going to bed at 10 o'clock and the next thing I knew it would be at three o'clock in the morning and I had just discovered a picture of the bridge he went over one month before, it, he went over it one month before it burnt down. But I found a picture of it on the web. The information I found was just wonderful. I shared some of this information with my family and Uncle Holt and then Uncle Holt said, I actually think I have some of the other items from his trip, which are some of the stuff over here. Lo and behold, he did have a treasure trove. It included postcard books, booklets, the original car sales receipt for the car, work IDs, and some of their maps. Holt lent them to me so that I could scan them and add them to the book. And upon his death, they gave them to me for safekeeping, so I now am in possession of the uh, artifacts. Now the history of the era just fascinated me. Did you know that the roads during this time frame were named and not numbered? You didn't have Highway 66, you had things like the Dixie Head Highway, the Dixie Trail Highway, the Arrowhead Trail, and the Union Pacific Highway, along with many more. Most of these roads were dirt, few were paved. If you traveled during this time, you needed to know how to change tire and do car maintenance. As I was working on the book, I mentioned to Susan and Pam, you know it would be fun to retrace his route. They smiled and the crazy people we are, we decided to, to do it and the trip was born. I had to research our route because I wanted to be at, as close as possible to granddad's route. But luckily he had actually put in, in his journal, some of the cities that he went through. So I would Google the cities, I would Google maps, and luckily I actually found some digitized maps from 1927, this was the year that they actually switched from named highways to numbered highways, and that's why they were available on the web. So I could find the highway that actually went through the cities at that time and then use Google Maps to actually make up our current route. Many of the roads are no longer in existence because they have been realigned, but we tried to get the route as close as possible and I don't think that at any time during the trip we were off the, his position by more than a mile. Now we would not be going directly across the country. As you can see in this picture, or in the blue route, we are going up and over and down. I mean, we went all the way up into Wyoming to go to California. Our route would be on country roads and through small towns. We were really going to get to see America. Not only did we have sh our Shutterfly book, but also made a website website 1922coasttocoast.com where all the information of the pictures and the journal and the history that I collected reside. So y'all can look it up, it's still there. I decided that the trip would not only be following granddad's route, but I had been collecting hotel points for many, many, many years. So I decided I would use my hotel points, who better to share my wealth of points and free nights with, but my two sisters. We went on this trip and stayed in a free hotel every night. No, we were not gonna camp like Granddad did. But you can tell us we did have an adventure. Next, I'm turning it over to Susan and Pam, and they're going to share with you a few of the journal entries. As you know, my grandfather's journal was what started us on this trip, so we have chosen some of the journal entries that he has, that we're gonna read the journal, his actual journal entry, and then tell you what we did on the trip to go along with it. We chose some that, we had, that he had taken pictures of so that you could see our pictures along with it. So first of all, Wednesday, September 6th, he wrote, got up early and proceeded over the Dixie Highway, which was so rough you could hardly travel it went through Rockwood, a coal mining town, then went over the mountains, stopped on top at a spring and filled Lib up, mostly coal mining country. 
hardly see a house every two or three hours, camped a few miles west of Sparta, had our first chicken supper that we didn't pay for. Mitch got it on his good running and accurate grabbing. See that chicken that Mitch has? Thank goodness we didn't have to catch our own chicken. <laughs> but just like them, we got up early and traveled the Dixie Highway. We went over the mountains and even stopped at a full service gas station, just like they did. In Mars Hill, we ate our lunch in a gazebo next to the road. And for supper that night, we really roughed it when we had pan-seared fish in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, we didn't even have to catch the fish. Not finding anything in Sparta, we traveled on to Murfreesboro to set up our camp in a hotel for the night. Monday, September 11th, he wrote. Got to East St. Louis, Illinois about 10 a.m. All of us got a haircut. Cross River to St. Louis, a city of about 800,000 population. Saw Detroit and St. Louis play here. St. Louis won 5-4. Ty Cobb and George Seisler both played. Seisler hurt his shoulder, but stayed in the game. Leave St. Louis about 5.30 p.m. Camped out in St. Charles, Missouri in a field by a straw stack. He said they left St. Louis around 5.30, but we didn't even get there to St. Louis until about 5.30 because we were having too much fun in Casey, Illinois. We'll tell you more about Casey a little bit later. We got there about an hour too late to catch any of the ball game, but we were able to get a picture with Sisler's statue next to the stadium. That was one of Dandy's favorite players, and he would be really proud of us. Leaving out of the city, we crossed the Mississippi River on the Eds Bridge, the same bridge they used to drive to, that we used to drive to St. Charles to select a nice hotel for our campsite, not a straw stack. Being the 4th of July, we were treated to a beautiful fireworks show over the river that night. Friday, September 22nd. Left for Lookout Mountain about 8 a.m. where William F. Cody, known as Buffalo Bill, is buried. Arriving there about 10 a.m. The grave is made of concrete with iron fence around it and U.S. flag flying over it. Nearby is museums showing all of Cody's old guns, saddles, bridles, uniforms, and other personal belongings. Also, Indian guns and other things which he captured. Scalp of Chief of Red Hand, who Cody killed in hand-to-hand -hand fight. Grave is on very top of mountain. Overlooks prairies for 50 miles around. Home of Hermit, who rode with Cody, is visible on opposite mountain. Get back to Longmont about 3 p.m. and take up our journey. Camp in Schoolhouse Yard near Fort Collins. In Buffalo Bill's Cody's Museum on top of Lookout Mountain, we saw many of the thing, same things that Dandy saw. At Cody's gravesite on the very top of the mountain, we tried our best to stand in the same position as Dandy and his friends, but it sure wasn't easy. Other than a concrete slab around the grave, it was a steep drop-off. Remember that Cody had just died several years before they actually had their picture made. That's hard for us to understand. Dandy was right. You could see for at least 50 miles from the top of Lookout Mountain. After traveling down the winding hairpin road off the mountain, we went through Estes Park, through gorgeous canyons, and stayed the night in Fort Collins, same as they did. Wednesday, September 27th. Mitch and myself relined brakes, etc. Went out to the Great Salt Lake about 11 o'clock. Could see salt and soil for miles before we got to lake, 150 miles long from 10 to 50 wide. Resemble sea as big waves rush around. Go back to city, buy some groceries. Bid G goodbye and head south over Arrowhead Trail. Very beautiful, down the valley we go. Wheat, vegetables, and fruit main crops. High mountains on both sides of us. Many large lakes. Meet girl horseback riding. Bill and Mitch make dates. Camp at Mr. Hudson's. Irrigation ditch goes very near our camp. Make bed under wagon bed. Not sure why Dandy didn't make a date, but anyway. Just like Dandy, we stopped to see the Great Salt Lake around 11 o'clock, and we left Salt Lake City on the Airhead Trail. Notice how similar his postcard is to our picture. 
but also notice how much smaller the Great Salt Lake is now. We'll fill you in on our Salt Lake adventure later in the program. Tuesday, October 10th. Got up early, decided to go back to San Pedro. Got job with LA Shipbuilding and Dry Docks Company. McDonald and I got to work at 12.40 p.m. washing pipes with gasoline. No one had stayed on it more than two hours. We stuck it out all of the afternoon, but our hands burned like fire. Ben and Mitch rented a one-room house during the evening near the yard and had a place to call home when we got off of work at 4.40 p.m. Had supper, wrote some, and retired. In San Pedro, we visited the shipyards where they worked. Today, the shipyards are much larger, but we were able to get some good pictures that closely match the pictures they made and postcards that they had. And finally, Tuesday, October 31st. Had a fine night's rest, had breakfast and left about 8.30 a.m. Had the most wonderful scenery yet. Passed through Devil's Canyon, which is well named. Had punctures galore, broke rear spring. Unjust fate seemed to be against us. Killed two rabbits, squirrel, and a quail, so we had fresh meat for supper. Cooked our supper out on the open desert. Then drove to Geronimo, where we camped. Cold as mild winter in North Carolina. Best we make our bed on the sands of the desert. Yes, Devil's Canyon was well named. Although quite beautiful and tempting, the road conditions were a devil to navigate. Look at this huge rut going across the road in this picture of Dandy. How did they navigate through such terrain? Even today, it's still curvy and rugged. And there's construction everywhere you turn from road slides and such. The area was filled with plenty of large cacti, and no wonder they took a picture with one. Notice they put a hat on it to represent Clarence. That's that reddish or pink area. We made one with the cactus too. Now why didn't we put a hat on it for Claire who made our picture? Oh well. We tried our best to find the town of Geronimo, but apparently it doesn't exist anymore. We drove right by the green field where the populated city once was on our way to Globe, Arizona, where we stayed for the night after feasting on Italian food, not wildlife like the guys. Tom has a way of changing things, and almost 100 years later, we certainly found this to be true on our trip. For example, their cars. Granddad's car was a 1920 Model T touring car. He bought it in 1922 for $408. He named the car the Lib after the woman he was dating, Elizabeth Easley, which turned out to be our grandmother. Driving that car was much driven, different than driving a car today. There are three pedals, the clutch, the reverse, and the brake. When the clutch, which is the leftmost pedal, is pressed all the way down, the car was in low gear. You would use low gear when you were starting out, when you were going less than 10 miles an hour, and when you were climbing hills. You had to keep the pedal pushed to the floor the entire time. When the pedal was in the halfway position, the car was in neutral, and this is when you could put the car in reverse. If you let the pedal out completely, the car was in high gear. There were two levers on the steering column. The right lever was a hand throttle or the accelerator. When the throttle was pulled down, the car went faster and the car went slowed when the throttle was pushed up. The left lever was used to adjust the spark plug timing. There were no turn signals nor windshield wipers and the car was open air. Can you imagine? going cross country on the dirt roads in an open air car, we couldn't. Now our car was different. We named our car the Lib 2. We drove in a Chrysler town and country that had less than 10,000 miles on it. It did have windshield wipers, turn signals, automatic windows, and air conditioning. We also had an automatic transmission, cruise control, and satellite radio. Additionally, we had stow-and-go seats so that we could carry all of our needed supplies, including a small refrigerator. Food. They cooked out over a camp stove almost the entire trip and off, 
often hunted for the food that they ate and roadkill. At least once a day, we ate our own food along the way at picnic tables, parks, gazebos, and sometimes even inside the van. We kept our food in coolers and even had the refrigerator for a few days before it died on us. Well, we were really roughing it. <laughs> but we also ate at some unique places, like with Cousin Floyd Blackwell in Houston, Texas, and at an almost 130-year-old seaside restaurant Hotel Del Coronado. We had Southwestern treats at the Hitching Post and good Southern food at the historical Wideman's restaurant, which was nearly 150 years old. Yes, we stayed away from the chain restaurants. We even partook in some fine dining where the food and the scenery was spectacular. Just look at that view from the Cliffside restaurant in St. George, Utah and lodging. They slept most nights under a tent that was part of their car, but they also slept in haystacks and a corn crib. They did this no matter what the weather was, rain, snow, heat, and cold. In San Pedro, they rented a house for three weeks and did stay with relatives when they were in the Denver and Ventura, California era. Thanks to Claire's stash of points, we got to stay in a hotel every night. Some of them were nice, and some of them were very nice. Almost all of them had free breakfast, too. And when we were done, she still had some points left over. We stayed at so many different hotels with different hotel rooms, we started to get confused. On numerous occasions after breakfast, we would forget our room number and struggle to figure it out. One morning, after Claire and I went to go get ice, our room key just wasn't working. So we convinced the maid to let us into our room, only to find out it wasn't even our room. We were one floor off. Even the maid had a good laugh on that one. Thankfully, no one was in the room. Multiple times a day, we experienced zany adventures that kept us in stitches. Here's a sampling of just a few of them. As we traveled across the country, we saw lots of different kinds of farms. Corn farms, wheat farms, and farms of all different kinds of crops. We also saw farms with pigs and cows and horses and chickens and all sorts of animals. But when we arrived in Louisiana, we encountered a whole new type of farm, a mosquito farm. And feast your eyes on the lovely picture that we have here. Water covered with green slime and who knows what sorts of creatures living underneath it on both sides of the road. We saw this kind of farm in, also in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina as well. None of us could imagine what our grandfather had gone through trying to camp in this area. We tried very hard to keep our car on the road because we thought if it went off the road we would be lost forever. When we finally made it to the West Coast, of course, I had to put my feet in the Pacific Ocean. I always have to put my feet in every body of water that we get to. Well, it was almost dusk, and the temperature was in the low 60s. The wind was whipping all around. It was really cold. But when you get to the Pacific Ocean, you have to get in. Susan and Claire didn't join me. They thought I was crazy. The next day, I coerced Claire to go into the ocean with me. Even in the bright sunlight, it was still cold. No, we didn't put our swimsuits on. We stayed in our clothes, thank you. In the middle of July, we are not California girls. Yes, this is the attire we wore at the beach in July. We're true Southern Bells. We longed for our warm waters of the Atlantic beaches while we were at the beach. Pam gave me the idea of getting stuffed animal that I could take pictures with along the trip so that I could share my trip with my granddaughter, who was at the time two years old. My plan is to give her the, the stuffed animal when I return. She loves turtles, so I found a turtle, and the next thing you know, turtle was on our adventure. But a few days later, I found the dino from the Sinclair dino. Um, 
gas stations, so Dino joined Turtle on our trip. Allie loved the daily pictures of Turtle and Dino's adventures. But along the way, we also picked up some dates. These dates were sure sweet, and we picked up several. Okay, now we're not talking about doing exercising, not doing those planks. What we're talking about is the plank road that used to exist between the Arizona and California border, the southern one. And it went through the sand dunes, and it was a plank road back in the 1920s. The plank road was made of wood and was a one-way road with turnouts every quarter mile. The road was only about 15 miles long. Travel on the road could be dangerous. The shifting sands caused many problems, but also the dry desert heat, traffic jams, fights, weather, could cause delays. It was advised that travelers should take extra blankets, food, water, car supplies, just in case of an emergency. It was not uncommon for a trip to take two days to go 15 miles. As the road became more heavily traveled, fights broke out when drivers going in the opposite direction refused to backtrack to the nearest turnoff, turnabout. As we were driving down the highway, Pam spots a place where you could actually see part of this original road. At this point in time, we were on the interstate, the only road through the area. Susan took the next exit so that we could go back and get pictures, and we had to backtrack five miles. I, of course, was in charge of pictures. This time, I missed the section completely, didn't even see it. Pam actually spotted it and said, this is where you need to start taking your pictures. So what did we do? Let's turn around and try again. I set the camera to continuous pictures so that I would get a lot. This time I hit the button, but too early. I got seven pictures, but not of the road, except the last one, you could see the road only when you really zoomed in. So rinse and repeat, we tried one more time, backing up five more miles to try to get it. Again, I set it to continuous mode and got a better shot, but it was still a little blurry. We gave up after that and headed on down the road. Speaking of plank roads, not only did we experience plank roads, but we experienced all sorts of road conditions. I'll admit, I didn't have too much experience driving dirt roads before this, but boy oh boy did I get some practice on this trip. Although one day, Claire did drive about eight miles on some dirt roads. I seemed to drive all the rest of the hundreds of miles of dirt roads on the trip. One day, I drove over 80 miles on a dirt, old dirt highway. Did you know there were still dirt highways in the United States? We didn't either. Some dirt roads were nice and compact and I could drive 60 miles an hour on them. Others were bumpy with loose rocks and so dusty that we had to go creepy slow. Along the way, we discovered why all the cowboys in the westerns wore bandanas. On many of the roads, we had to use Kleenexes over our faces, even with the windows up and the air is recirculating. We can't even imagine how bad it must have been in Dandy's open Model T. Surely they were covered with dirt. Going west, most of our dirt roads were right next to the train. The older roads, or many of them, are right next to the train track, and this was because the train, the railroads had easements near the train, and therefore it was easier to put the roads there. It was also that they went through a lot of small towns, and so driving back then was hazardous, and this was made it safer for when somebody was doing it. So it's you drive along old highways now, notice that there is oftentimes a railroad close by. And there was stuff in the road. We came across big farm equipment in the road. Big farm equipment in the road. And when we passed by, there were little kids driving the big farm equipment, some not older than my grandson, Donnie, who's just now in fifth grade. And there were animals in the road. There were cows in the road, and goats in the road, and sheep in the road. And there was grass in the road. Where are the cows when you need them? And there's sand in the road. Sometimes there was so much sand in the road that you couldn't find the road. 
and there were rocks in the road. Sometimes the rocks were so big, you can't go over them, you can't go around them, so you just go through them. And then there are bricks in the road. A lot of times in the old towns, we looked at, we got to see and drive over the roads that were paved with bricks, and those were very beautiful. And then there was a river in the road. This picture in no way does justice to this whole scene. And you, first of all, I wish you could have been there. It was pouring rain, and we were driving, and this road is really at a 45 degree angle. The picture we made was from the car of another car, so it doesn't look like the angle is what it is. My sister was driving and had to weave down the hill because it was so steep, it gave me the heebie-jeebies. Now, so we drive down, and suddenly the Ohio River is at the bottom of this. There's no fence, no anything. There's just the river. And so when we got there, and it's kind of dusk, you can't, it's hard to tell that too. We turned and drove back up, and then we saw a sign at the top that says, Road Ends in River. It's like, no joke! <laughs> Driving down. It was quite scary. And there are curves in the road. We drove over lots and lots of curvy roads. I did most of the driving on the curvy roads. And then there are waves in the road, especially in the desert. We came across many roads that were very wavy. When we were in the Denver area, we went to Lookout Mountain, which Pam had talked about earlier. Now, we were in the Denver area a couple days, and every day that we were there, Susan wore her Panther t-shirt because the Panthers in Denver played in the uh, Super Bowl a couple years back. Well, in this picture, Susan was out of control, so Pam had to corral her in. Then, you know, they both got out of control, so what I had to do was go get my gun and put them, you know, make them calm down. But we did go through the entire Cody Museum and saw many of the items that Granddad saw. At the end, we even got in the car and we decided our chips enjoyed the ride, that they really liked the altitude. As we were going through Arizona, we went through an area that was very surreal, and it looked like we had stepped back in time. There were mountains just of big, rounded boulders, not at all like the mountains that we have around here. There was no vegetation, no soil or anything. It was just mountains and mountains of these huge, rounded boulders. I can't imagine how the first people ever traversed the area. Yes, and all those rocks were really hot. Although the Pacific Ocean was really cold, the barren rocks of the west picked up heat and it was scorching hot everywhere else. In the middle of July, numerous days were well over 100 degrees. Here's a picture of the van when we had to take it to go get it serviced. It gave us an alarm that said, oh, I need to get uh, my oil change. And this was in Las Vegas. Now, Claire told you about having the um, turtle and the dinosaur for her grandchildren. Well, for my grandsons, Donnie and Alex, I collected rocks for them. And not only for them, but for our Bible school. They were doing a rock program that summer. So I collected rocks from all over the country. So anytime we saw a place with new rocks, we stopped, I got out and got rocks. Well, especially in the desert, there were some really interesting rocks. And so the rocks were quite hot, and everybody laughed at me when I jumped out and got hot rocks. And even when we got to the volcanoes, I jumped out and got very hot black volcanic rocks. So you should have seen me jump out and throw them in the car. Well, everybody got tickled about that too, but I got them interested in rocks as well. So we had rocks from all over the United States, and we got so interested in rocks that we even stopped at a couple of rock shops and one especially in Deming, New Mexico. By the time we got back to um, North Carolina, our car was full of rocks. A good portion of our trip from California to Texas was right along the Mexican border. 
you really had to watch it and make sure you didn't take a wrong turn because there was no re-entry and you better had your passport. Each time, well, multiple times, we had to go through border control. And no, border control wasn't right at the, we didn't go across the border. They would have it a few miles in. And they would ask us, are you an American citizen? We'd say yes. How close were we to the border wall? This is a picture from the car, and there is the wall. We were so close to Mexico, Susan's phone kept texting her, welcome to Mexico. Were we close for a long time? Yes, for a very long time. And then we kept hitting border control. And again, each time they would ask us, are you an American citizen? Then we saw more wall fence. And then we hit border control again. This time I said, Susan, should we say, si, senor? <laughs> but we agreed that that probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> we could even see the border wall from our hotel room. That's how close we were to the border the entire time between California and Texas. We also ran into things that were very much out of perspective, some unbelievably large things. My job, once Claire gave me the itinerary, was to find interesting things along the route. I used Roadside America and TripAdvisor and many other resources to scout out strange and interesting things that we could do and take off and come back and stay on our route. I found a plethora of cool places, but I hit the jackpot with KC, Illinois. It is a little town with a lot of big stuff, and I mean really, really big stuff. They have the world's largest wind chime, rocking chair, golf tee, pitchfork, wooden shoe, mailbox, crochet hook, and knitting needles. They also have a giant corn, pencil, yardstick, ear of, giant, giant coin, I'm sorry, ear of corn, birdcage, and several other things. Each year they build something new. What happened was when they built the interstate, they bypassed the town and the town died. And so the town decided that they would build something new each year to draw the people back into the town. Naturally, we had to get pictures with everything. We even got inside the giant mailbox and the giant birdcage. What I enjoyed most about the world's largest things in KC, Illinois was that each one had a specific verse of scripture that matched the item. For instance, this pencil had Proverbs 7-3, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Now not everything that we encountered on our trip was extremely large. Some were ridiculously small. For instance, we drove five miles off our route, then back, to go to Andrews Geyser in North Carolina, and this is what we found. Now, would you call this a geyser? But we only had to drive just a mile off our path to see the, the smallest town in the United States, population one. <laughs> And right beside the road in Illinois, we came upon this tiny prayer chapel. Of course we had to go inside. I went up to the pulpit and started reading scripture where it was open. And Susan sat on the front row and started singing, How Great Thou Art. And Claire started laughing in the back of the church, singing, um, I was preaching to the choir. <laughs> We were going through Kansas, and we knew that it might be boring, so we set out to have some fun. We stopped in Oakley and decided to live out the wild, wild west for a little while. In Wamego, we followed the Yellow Brick Road, and we visited the Wizard of Oz Museum. Near St. George, we saw a Model T going down the road and we chased it down. <laughs> it scared the driver half to death. <laughs> oh well, they didn't know us in Kansas, so we got some good pictures anyway. I had some fun trying to bust open a watermelon for us to eat, but it bounced just like a basketball. <laughs> and Claire went rummaging through some cans looking for spare parts for our worn out bodies. Apparently, she found a new knee there. And 
then we got to Salt Lake City, otherwise known as Salt Lake City, for those of you who have seen the Book of Mormon. While we were there, we stopped at the lake for a picnic lunch, just as my grandfather had done. But we met Pahu, a full-blooded, not Navajo, Indian who entertained us all during lunch with his tales. After lunch, we decided to head down to the water. Pam, who always has to get in the water everywhere we go, decided that she would get in the water here as well. Now, I want you to look at the edge of this. This is black. This is not black sand. This is dead black brine, fi brine flies. Now, there are a few living ones there too, but it's mostly dead brine flies. So Pam goes right in the water and sinks up over her ankles in these dead brine flies. And it sinks in just like quicksand and sucks her sandals off. It was really yucky. So we laughed at her. We stopped at a small mission outside of Texas in the middle of nowhere and were posing for a picture when Susan and I saw a car pass. The car turned around and headed back towards us, parked, and two men got out of the car. Susan and I yelled to Pam, back in the car now. We ran, jumped in, locked the doors, and sped off towards the small closest town. The other car also left and followed us for a little bit. It was scary, but who knew three middle-aged women could run so fast? Don't leave them unattended. That's talking these two. The windows of the van were constantly getting dirty, and so we used up all the windshield wiper fluid and needed a refill. We were in Rosenberg, Texas, and Granddad had actually done repairs on his car in Rosenberg, so we figured this was the perfect place to actually get some more uh, fuel or liquid. Well, I went in to see if I could get the fluid, and the clerk, clerk said, you're going to have to wait a few minutes. I'm busy over here. Well, I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And as after waiting for a little bit, I started getting, ah, oh, it's crazy. And you could see Susan and Pam out there. And so I started doing antics, dancing and making funny faces and stuff. And they pick up the camera and start taking pictures. And I think, oh, I'm getting all kinds of pictures made of me. Oh, no, 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 no. They couldn't see inside. They were just making pictures of selfies. And so they were taking pictures on the outside of taking pictures of themselves. And so you can't leave them. We were out of control. We, we took lots of selfies, and we even took pictures of us making pictures. Here's one of us eating apples next to the Missouri River. A picture of us making pictures of Mushroom Rock State Park at Oak Alley Plantation, at the Hummus House Plantation, another picture of taking pictures, at the Sunken Gardens in San Antonio, Texas, and finally in Gastonia when we had made it all the way around the loop. I should be saying, here come the Beverly Hillbillies. In San Antonio, there's a fancy smancy five-star hotel called the St. Anthony, and it was built in 1909. It would have been there when my granddad actually went through the area. Well, the year before, I had actually been there as treasurer of a conference, and so, i.e., the checkbook. And so, the or the hotel was very interested in my thoughts and feels. The thing was, was we were the first conference in the first set of rooms to be done after their renovation. So they really wanted to have our feedback. So they asked me everything that had gone wrong, which I had this massive list of things that had gone wrong. They said, well, they would offer me some extra Starwoods points. And I said, well, I'm going to be coming through here next year on this trip with my granddad. Would anything about being a free room? And they said, sure, but you've got to use it within a year. So they gave me a free room. Little did they know that the Beverly Hillbillies were going to show up next year. Remember, now, this is a five-star resort. So these are the type of vehicles that would actually typically be, you'd see the parking at the valet. But again, they didn't expect what arrived the next year. 
right before we arrived in San Antonio, our van looked like this. <laughs> After 5,000 dirty, dusty miles without a bath, what did you expect? <laughs> Claire stayed at this ritzy place, but she didn't forewarn us. So Susan and I were caught totally off guard as I drove up in front of the hotel and several valets started walking our way. Now Claire made a quick escape to go check us in, leaving the two of us to fend for ourselves in the van. Oh, how embarrassing. Susan and I noticed the valets were standing over there talking amongst themselves, surely thinking and arguing over who's gonna take us. <laughs> Finally, um, and we were both just last night, I just put my head down on the steering wheel because I was crying so hard. Finally, two valets apparently that drew the short stalls came over and up to the window with tears streaming down my face, trying to pull together anything I could get in a voice. I did my best to tell them our story and try to explain the dirt on the van. After talking with the valets, they loved every minute of it and wanted to know more of our story. Well, it's a really good thing because we had piqued their interest and in true hillbilly style, we had the valets completely unload the back of our van and wheel it all in piled up on two luggage racks through their fancy fancy hotel lobby. <laughs> all the stairs we received, the hillbillies had arrived. <laughs> Once we were in our fancy four-room suite, we carried on like a bunch of country bumpkins <laughs> in the opulence that surrounded us. I quickly put on one of the guest robes while Susan and Claire checked out all the rooms in our suite. By the next day, all the valets in the hotel had heard our stories and, and kept stopping to talk with us. We laughed and learned many of their own personal stories. It was fun and they said that we were the nicest people that they had ever had there that their regular patrons don't normally even acknowledge them. So in the long run, the Beverly Hillbillies made their day. So after the trip, as you can tell, we you know, have done many things together. But on this trip, you can tell there was laughter, there were antics, there were numerous hotel rooms and loads of stories that we lived. Each day along the road, we recorded notes and we tried to post them to the travel blog so that our family and friends could enjoy the trip along with us. Shortly after the returning from the trip, I had the job of typing up the notes so that we could preserve the history and use it to sort through the thousands and thousands of pictures we made along the way. Somewhere in that process of writing the notes, a story began to emerge much like our grandfather's story. It was part our story, it was part his story, but it was nonetheless a hilarious tale. Although I typed the notes for family history, something else originated from the notes, a book. Not just any book, but mind you, a hilarious book about our travels, told from the perspective of our rental van. The personification of the van was the only way I could attempt to capture the true amusement of our antics on this trip. Nearly finished, the book will hopefully be the first in a series of books entitled The Hilarious Adventures of the Traveling Van, each based on, a diff on the different travels we've taken as sisters that our grandfather's journey inspired. The first book in this series is sub subtitled Live to Goes West. I hope you'll grab a copy to take the full journey of our hilarious historical adventures when the book is published. So, where all have we gone? Well, our trip started the very first year, the year before our big trip in 2015, when we took Mom and my cousin Sally up to New England. Our trip was to take Mom to visit her sister who lives in New Jersey. And while we were there, we decided we would, we would go through the New England states together. The very next year, we went on the big trip across the United States, so we picked up a lot of states there. And we decided that we enjoyed each other's company so much, and we had such a wonderful time that we would do a trip together every year thereafter. And we decided we wanted to make it a point to see all of the 50 states together. 
So the next, uh, and we put 7,700 miles on the van that year. So the next summer in 2017, we did a trip to the Pacific Northwest and we picked up a whole lot of the national parks in the Pacific Northwest and we rented a van then and put 4,800 miles on the van, and that was in the summer of 2017. This past summer, we rented another van and put 4,400 miles on the van. We flew into Denver and we did the Utah and Arizona National Parks, and then we did a little loop to pick up some of those middle states that we haven't done or hadn't done at that point in time already. And so far, these are all the states that we have visited together. So where are we going this year? And this year, we're hoping to pick up Florida for um, one little trip, and then we're gonna pick up some of the states that are near us that we've all kind of visited, but we haven't visited together. And then we'll have three trips after that, one for that, what I call the Norse region with the Dakotas and Minnesota, and then we'll have to do a separate trip to Hawaii and a separate trip to Alaska. Were we meant to find Dandy's journal and take this adventure? We surely think so. It's changed our lives. This trip was truly a blessing and it's just what we needed. Each of us had come out of several difficult years. Not only did this journey back in time rekindle our sisterly love, but the constant laughter we shared all day long for nearly a month was pure medicine for our souls. You know how the saying goes, laughter is the best medicine. Well, we took some heaping doses of deep down belly jerking, tear streaming, can't catch your breath medicine on this trip. None of us can remember laughing so hard and it happened every day, almost all day long. When we got back from this trip, we realized we never even did turn the radio on in the vehicle. We had, were having so much fun. We can only hope that our grandchildren or our great grandchildren will someday stumble across the things and discover the same treasure chest of history for themselves. Perhaps adventures await for your family as well. Just think what might be tucked away somewhere waiting for you to discover. If you would like to look into the full history behind our story or read travel blogs from our 1922 trip, you can visit our website at www.1922coasttocoast.com. Perhaps you'd like to join the sisters on our next journey by signing up for our travel blog. Just email Claire at the email address on the screen. Please feel free to browse through any of our original items before you leave today. We want to thank Cindy and the Heritage Museum and Bill Tate and the others and all of you for inviting us to share our family story and all of our fun adventures. We hope you enjoyed our drive back in time. Do any of you have any questions? Well, thank you so much. We enjoyed it. Thank you, Susan, Claire, and Pam for your excellent presentation today. And now for more of their photos.
Thank you for supporting our Caldwell Heritage Museum here in Lenore, North Carolina. Thanks to local well-known musician Gregory Knight for the use of his music in this video.